The Lick Observatory is open during the daytime hours for the general public to walk around and view the museum and facilities during the day. Not everything is available for viewing, but some of the major telescopes can be seen through windows or behind roped barriers. Last month, during this summer on August 1st, 2025, I participated in the six-hour nighttime guided tour at this renowned astronomy institution. This is the world's first astronomical observatory purposely built on a mountaintop, employing the world's largest telescope at that time with first light in 1888. It was a momentous construction project, privately funded by the richest man in California at the time as his unique legacy to mankind. The Lick Observatory is located on Mount Hamilton, east of San Jose in the California Diablo Mountain Range. It sits at 1,300 meters in altitude and enjoys as much as 300 cloud-free nights per year. During the entire month of August, I stayed at my elder brother's house near to Milpitas, California. From there it takes only about one hour to drive up to the observatory, but the treacherous winding road has over 300 turns as it snakes up the mountain slopes. In the early days when this observatory was built, the skies were as dark as can be, but the encroachment of the modern urban sprawl makes this site now a Bortle Class 4. Besides its storied past, this observatory is still an active center for astronomical observational research and part of the University of California education system. The founder, or should we say the funder, was James Lick, a man with a fascinating life rising from a humble start as a piano craftsman, which over the years took him to South America and then up to San Francisco, where his intuition and luck in real estate, just before the gold rush, brought him immense riches. One of his South American trade connections even added to the riches when he partnered with a guy named Ghirardelli and imported raw cocoa to California. The rest is history, I'm sure you know. James Lick now lies interned directly under the telescope mount at the top of Mount Hamilton. This is Monique. She was the tour guide for a group of about 20 people, including myself, my brother Phil, and a friend Chloe, who joined this limited and exclusive tour. Monique is a PhD candidate in astronomy, studying at some local institution, presumably in the University of California, so her knowledge and credentials were well suited. On this tour night, of which there are only a few per month, the moon was at nearly 50%, but of no consequence to the viewing we enjoyed later. The scenery from this mountain top prior to the sunset was truly spectacular, but you can see how dry it is in the summertime here, with the specter of brush fires a constant concern. We started our tour by walking around the main building and then down this road toward multiple other domes located further along the crest of the mountain, passing several along the way with detailed explanations provided by Monique. But this is where we stopped, at the C. Donald Chain Telescope, the largest dome and instrument on the mountain. It was the second largest telescope in the world when it was commissioned. Seeing its first light in 1959, this 120-inch reflector can be used in three different imaging configurations, providing flexibility in research applications. This telescope is especially notable for being an early pioneer of adaptive optics technology, which is now employed by all newish terrestrial megatelescopes around the world. Its size was impressive, as you can see here in these photos. After a detailed explanation about this telescope, we were allowed to stroll 180 degrees around the catwalk on the outside of the dome, providing some spectacular views of the observatory and the distant horizons.
After that, we headed back up the same road to the main building where the historical telescope dome was located for the next phase of our tour. Along the way, I happened to meet up with a Lick Observatory staff member and his darling daughter covered in stars. The man, her father, is a maintenance engineer for all telescopes at the summit. Their family resides permanently here on the mountaintop. Surprisingly wise beyond her years, the young lady would not share her real name, but rather gave me an alias of May. And with her father's verbal permission, I am including her here in this video. Her astrophotography red starry dress hints at a curiosity about the night sky. Upon arrival back at the main building, we took a little coffee and relaxation time to watch the sunset over the San Francisco Bay and Santa Cruz Mountains to the north and west. After sundown, the group then convened in a conference room where another guide, a young lady named Ruby, proceeded to tell us all about the storied past of James Lick and the construction of the observatory, telescope, and roads that made this institution possible. This was all done with horse and buggy, keep in mind. Ruby's slide presentation was filled with historical photographs and information that kept you captivated with plots of intriguing twists, romance, international business, lady luck, and San Francisco history. In its nearly 150 years, there have been many notable astronomers that have worked and made discoveries here that shaped our understanding of the universe photon by photon. Some of them are listed here, with the most recognizable name for me being Edward Barnard. But that is just because I am an astrophotographer and interested in dark nebulae. I even made a short YouTube video brief about him and Barnard's star that I published about a year ago. The link to that video is provided in the notes below. After the slideshow presentation, it was off to the main attraction, the 36-inch aperture, 17-meter long refractor telescope straight out of the Jules Verne Tesla era that surprisingly still works today. And best of all, we were all going to view the night sky with it that evening. These were the planned viewing targets for the group, a double star, the M13 globular cluster, and a planetary nebula. For the first two targets, because they were so bright, the lights were left on during viewing for public safety. But for the last nebula target, the bright lights were turned off and the dome was bathed in a dim red illumination so we could all adjust our eyes and observe the colorful planetary nebula more easily. And as you will soon see, it also provided for some really cool telescope and night sky photographs. Oh, I can see it moving.
happy feet. They found out that there was a third star there using um, spectroscopy. So it's called a spectroscopic binary The flint and crown glass lenses for this achromatic refractor were made by a premier lens manufacturer in Europe at that time. The story is, it took many attempts and years to get it just right, which was only possible after bringing the retired founder of the lens company, a master craftsman, out of retirement to oversee the project. These were the biggest glass lenses ever manufactured up until that time, making this telescope the largest and most powerful in the world for about a decade after its first light. And so this planetary nebula is called NGC 6572 and it has very bright bluish green colors. Because this planetary nebula, when this star died and left behind the white dwarf in the center, it expelled very oxygen rich gas. So, this oxygen rich gas is what gives it the colors that you're going to see. At a focal ratio of F19, in my opinion, there did not appear to be any noticeable chromatic aberration on the stars or objects we viewed that night with our eyes. The viewing experience was remarkable considering the age of the glass and the telescope itself. Frankly, I was in awe thinking about me using the same telescope as Edward Barnard and other great astronomers from so many decades ago. To survive the years, the craftsmanship of these early era scientific equipment is nothing short of remarkable. I have seen it in the brass microscopes during my career in biotechnology, and now I have experienced it in an enormous telescope as well. This was quite a privilege. In the photo on the left is the original viewing ladder used in the late 1800s to reach the eyepiece for this telescope, and like many other observatories of that era, the wooden floor was made to rise and fall to provide more convenient viewing. The floor, movement of the telescope dome, and even some mechanics of the telescope clock mechanism were originally powered by water hydraulics fed from a local mountain stream. However, the floor is now permanently fixed and stationary due to its age and deterioration. Monique and Ruby told us some fascinating stories and truly provided us an education. I wholeheartedly recommend that anyone with an interest in astronomy sign up for this tour. It was well worth it. I don't exactly remember when we completed the viewing, but it had to be sometime around 11 p.m. Afterwards, there were a few of us diehards that stuck around to capture some outdoor architecture and Milky Way images of the institution and the beautiful clear night skies. Despite the hour, the cities of San Jose to the west and San Francisco and Oakland further to the north were still brightly lit as you might expect. So here I will leave you with a few final images of the Milky Way and the historical Lick Observatory domes. Thanks for hanging out to join me on this remarkable adventure in the Diablo Mountains on the west coast of the USA.
in California on vacation. I am JP Astro Guy, getting away from the Tokyo and Yokohama heat and humidity, and here enjoying the beautiful clear skies. My name is Paul Cheesegel, and thank you sincerely for watching Astrophotography Japan.